YouTube is better, so I'll just take the videos I have from previous years, put them there, not related to this class. So, um, where are we? Where are we? We are here, right? That's, we kind of have two tracks in our hand right now, in number theory, modulo arithmetic. One was, how do I get the inverse via this power set? Right? And we, we did some exercises and recitation where we say if there is an inverse, right, which is to say uh, for this to work, we need the GCD of A and N to be 1. Hi. So the question is it doesn't seem to be enough light on the board. It's not light in the room, but the board seems to be kind of in the back. I'm not sure if that's fixable or not. We try to play with those. Uh -huh. But does this seem to be like the board is in the back kind of thing? Yeah, here it is. Um, so we try to play with those bottoms in there, and there's another set of bottoms on the other side. Okay. Uh, now, if there's, that's a design, that's a design. Uh, the usually classrooms have more light to the board. It's not possible, it's not possible. Usually, um, like when the projector is on, we usually try to keep these lights off. Right, right. So I know that. Right. So there's usually some lights that you turn on and off if you have a projector. We, we don't use the projector today, for example. Okay. And I feel like they have plenty of lights in the room, but board seems to be. Anyway. I just say, yeah, you got like, because I get like, So there's no setting that I can turn more light in here. I have to get on with my lecture, but okay, if, you can, if you can play with it. Yeah. Okay. So there was one thing, we, we can call it, you know, uh, A or 1. We have two tracks. And this is 2. So what we want to do today is kind of do two lectures in one. Because our lectures are 100 minutes and the regulars are just 60. And we want to advance both these tracks. So I'll take on this one first, and then we do a bunch of things. And then I'll stop, and I say, we're done with that track. And we come back on Euclid algorithm, and we work on that one. So um, <coughs> where this one goes, how do we expand that idea? We're going to need to do something that's called a set of co-primes factorization. Very related to this set. Um, and then there's a bunch of theorems that we, we're going to look at. Uh, so, Euler's Totian function. Funny name that's called P of N. <coughs> yeah. That's where this track is going. So let me talk a little bit about uh, this. By the way, this attendance sheet, whose turn is to start now? Is it on this side now? <coughs> okay. Make sure you pass it all over the place. Um, here's what we're going to do we're going to take an N. And uh, we're going to say it's n like before is the remainders at n. But then we're going to say not all these values are co-primes, right? Like, so for example, c26 is 0, 1, 2, all the way to 25. Now, I want to define another set, I'm going to call it CN, which is the elements in here which happen to be co-prime with N. So I'm going to say who is in ZN and has the property GCD of A and N equal 1. So I'm going to look at these elements here and I'm going to say which ones of them are co-primes with N. So, in Z26, I'm going to have C26. What are the elements in Z26 co-prime with N? N being 26 in here. So let's see. 1 is co-prime, certainly. Right? Is 0 co-prime? No. Is 2 co-prime in 26? Sure. 
has no common factors, 2 and 26. You guys sure about that? Yeah. 2 and 26. Is there any prime that divides both? Two. Yeah. Which one? 2. two. So oh, 2 yeah. is no good. What's the next co-prime that has no common factors with 26? 3. 3. How about 4? No. no. 5? Yeah. 6? Why not? Because of 2. 7? 8? 8? No. No, because 8 has a common factor with 26. 9? Yeah. yeah. 10? 11, 12, 12, is 12 co prime 26? No. How about 13? No. Because 26 is 13 times 2, right? How about 14? No. How about 15? Yes. 16? No. 17? Yeah. What's the next one? 19. 21? Yeah. 23. 25. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay? So, Z26 is the set of all remainders at 26. Z26 is a subset. We say, we say this Z of N is included in Z of N because it's a subset. Right? And it's a particular subset, specifically only the elements that are relatively prime with that. Now, this could be bigger or smaller. For some, Z26, Z26 might be almost all of them. Like, for three, another example here, I should pick a bigger one. How about if I pick example n equals seven? Z26 is who? Zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? And who's C7? What are, zero is never co-prime, because zero is multiples of seven. But everybody else, it's co prime. Right? Every, every other number except multiples of 7 are co prime with 7. So this is very close, sometimes very close, sometimes it's not. Z26, all remainders. C26, only the co prime remainders, aka the ones that have no common factors. So if you pick a prime, then it would be. Like this. If it's a prime number like 7 or 11 or 19, everything except 0 is co prime with that prime because the only common factor possible is the prime itself. So if it's not 0, everything is co prime. Very good. And as a definition, P of n is the size of Cn. In other words, we write P of n, this funny Greek letter P, it's the size of the set. How many elements are co-prime? This is a, you guys know this notation? The size of a set, how many elements are in there between bars? Who knows this notation? Hands up. If I put two bars on a set, I mean how many elements are in the set. So how many elements are here? P of 26. Is it? If n is 26, how many co-primes are there? 12. How about here, p of 7, how many are here? 6. 6. Hmm. Not too bad. Uh, so how about we, we, we look at this more systematically. We say, take a bunch of numbers. What is n? n is 2. Uh, what is, let make a little table here. Who is the set c of n? Right, so for two, what are the <coughs> co-primes in Z2? It's only <coughs> one, right? that's the set. And then uh, let's say here, P of N. Let's write P of N. 
this table. <coughs> but that's the size of Cn. So this phi of n uh, will be, in this case, it's one, right? It's only one element that's co prime with two. As we only look at remainders, right? We only look in the set Z26. How about for three? What is this set going to be? One and two. <coughs> so phi of three is two. How about for four? What are the co primes with four? Remainders that are co primes. One is always there. Three. Three. So this is <coughs> two, right? <coughs> How about for five? One, two, five is a prime number, like he was saying. So what are going to be the co primes of five? Three and four. All except zero. So that's four. Um, Seven we already did, let's do six here. Six is gonna be what? One is co-prime with six. One is always in the set. <coughs> Who else is in here? Five. Two? Oh, no. no. Three? <coughs> no. Four? So it's five, right? So that's uh, two of them. This number is just how many elements are in this set. That's it, there's no, no big deal in here. How about, so seven we did, let's try something else. Let's try um, 15. Who are the co-primes with 15? One. What's next? Four. Four. Six. Six, are we sure? Um, we are not sure. Seven. Eight. Eight. Eight is not a prime number, obviously, but has no common factors with 15. Eight has only one prime in it many times, which is two, but there's no twos in 15, so it's co-prime. What's next, nine? No, because nine has common factors with 15. 10? No. 11? 12? No. 13? 14? Actually, n minus one is always a co-prime. So 1 and n minus 1 are guaranteed co-primes in that set. The only exception when that's weird is that 1 and n minus 1 is the same value, like in here. Like 1 and 2 minus 1 is the same. But other than that, 1 and n minus 1 are guaranteed values in this co-prime set. You can easily prove that 1 and n minus 1 have no common prime factors with n. So what's the size of this set? 8. Okay. Very good. How about, uh, let's say, 18? <coughs> What's in this set, in 18? One, who else? Five. Five, seven, 11, 13, 17. How many? <coughs> How about 19? <coughs> 19 is a prime number, so everything except zero is a co-prime. <coughs> Hands up who follow me so far. So I'm gonna write in MATLAB notation, instead of saying one, two, three, up to 19, when people put a dot like this, it means all the number one to 19. So when you see a colon between zero and 100, that means all the values starting at zero ending up 100, all the integers, right? So this notation means all the set from 1 to 19. It's just not 1 and 18, just those two. Everybody. <laughs> so the size of that would be how many elements are in there? 19. Sorry, it's not two. 19, yes. it's 2. 18, because it's only remainders. So how many elements I have there? 18. Let's do one more. Uh, let's take, for example, 20. And what are the co primes with 20? 1, it's always there. 2 is good. No. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine is good because nine is three squared, but there's no three in 20. Okay? Which is next? 11, 
13, 17, 19. 19. So how many? Eight? Okay. So this is uh, the co-prime set. And our job in here is to, to get at the, the co-prime set structure <laughs> or factorization. That, that's, that's our job for the first part of the lecture. So we now, so far we have the co-prime set, which is a subset of Z of n. That's the remainders that are prime. And we have this phi, which is the size of it. How many are there? So now I'm going to uh, look at one of the examples that we, yes? Um, so like if x is co-prime, it's n minus x always. Correct. Because if x is co-prime, means the GCD of x and n is 1. Now let's look at n minus x. n minus x, that's the one that is actually, is this one co-prime, plus x gives me n. Correct? So now, if there will be a factor that's by contradiction, if there is a common factor P that divides n minus x, n divides n, right? If there is between those two, there is a common prime factor P, like 2 or 3 or 5 or 7. Because they have a linear relation, that P must divide the difference. Remember theorem 1 that was saying if P divides a quantity, n divides another quantity, must divide their difference. In other words, if this is a multiple of P, and that's a multiple of P, the difference, which is x, it's also a multiple of p. Because if I subtract two multiples of p, or I add two multiples of p, I get a multiple of p. But that's impossible. x cannot be divisible by p, right? Because the GCD wouldn't be 1. Who follow this? If, if n minus x and n will have a co-prime factor p together, that factor will divide their difference, which is x. And then x and n will have a co-prime p, which we said that's not, it's given the premise that that's not true. That has to do with the theorem 1 from the notes. So uh, now I'm going to pick, so I have an n, I have z of n, uh, that's 0, 1, 2, n minus 1. And I have c of n, which is the co-primes remainders, right? so it's a subset of zero. Right? Now I'm going to pick an A in C of n. So that is GCD of A and n equal 1. I can pick any one of these co-primes. If my n is 15, I can pick any one from this list. Um, so I'm going to start with an example here. I'm going to say, as an example, uh, suppose n is 26, that's one example we did in class, a recitation, and a is 9. Uh, so I'm going to build this power set of a, which is a, a squared, a to the v. At some point I'm going to get 1. This is the theorem that we've done last time, that if you take uh, an a, co prime, and you build the powers, eventually you get 1. This is a theory from last time. There was a theorem that was saying if GCD of A and N is 1 if and only if there is an inverse uh, and uh, the set power set A, A squared, everything up to B equal 1. This everything is modulo N. Uh, B is called the order of A. That's the theorem that we stopped at last uh, time. So, uh, maybe, maybe we should do a quick recap from last time of how did we prove this, if you guys, if you guys don't remember that proof. Uh, the proof is not essential for us, but it's good to have it. It's not, it's not complicated. What the proof was saying here, it's saying that P of A is an infinite sequence 
that fits <coughs> in Zn, which is finite. In Zn, there's only so many elements. Well, every time we try to fit an infinite sequence <coughs> in a finite set, values have to be repeating, right? It's like saying if I put 20 students in 10 classes, at least two students have to go in the same class. Or if I have 400 people with only, how many birthdays are in a year? 365 possible birthdays, right? But I have 400 students, at least two of them must have the same birthday, right? Because if everybody have a different birthday, then not enough birthday in the year to cover 400 people, right? <coughs> Anybody know this is pigeonhole principle? If I have too many things crowded in fewer boxes or items or birthdays, some of them has to go into the same box. Same principle here, this set is infinite, big, and that set is finite, so therefore some of those things must be repeated. So it means powers of A, P of A, have repeated values. Let's say something like A at uh, U, A at U plus V, right? That's kind of two powers. Maybe U is three and U plus V is seven or something like that. Um, modulo N. That means that uh, A at U times A at V minus one is uh, zero modulo N. Because I take the difference, the difference has to be, if they have the same remainder, the difference is zero modulo n. So now the difference is, uh, I take common factor a at u, that's a one, and that's a at v. So that means n must divide a at u times a at v minus one. But the GCD of a at u and n is one. These two values here, n and a at u, are co-prime. Why is that? Why is it that any power of a is co-prime with n? So think about where I started. I started with the co-prime of n. a is co-prime. If a is co-prime, so does any power of a must be co-prime. So that's coming from the fact that GCD <coughs> of A and N equal one. That implies, <coughs> anybody can explain to me why that is? Why if A is co-prime with N, no common primes, A at any power must be also co-prime, yes? It's like you're not adding any more primes in, you're just using the primes you have. But A at U, where does A at U, I think you're saying A at U, where does A at U takes its prime factors? A. Yeah. Only from A. Yeah. It has a lot more of them because it's A at U. So if it's a P in the value, P prime here, that's going to be P at U in there. But there's no new primes. Whatever prime was in A will be in A at U, but A at U cannot come up with new primes by itself. The prime factors must come from A. If none of those primes are common with N, then A at U will have no common prime factors. So the explanation is all the primes in English, all the primes in A at U come from A. How many people follow this? Hands up. Right? So now if N is co-prime with this, there is a theorem in the notes that you can prove as an exercise. It's saying every time a number divides a product, but it's co-prime with one of the factors, it means it must divide <coughs> the other factor. So n must divide a at v minus one, the other factor. So if divide the product, is co-prime with one of the factors, must be di dividing the other factor. Now that's exactly what we want to prove. That's essentially the same as saying a at v is one <coughs> modulo n, right? That's what this means. <coughs> And then I found V the order. Obviously, if V is the order, V minus 1 will be the inverse power because A at V minus 1 <coughs> times A just gives me 1. This is the stuff that we did last time.
who is following this. I know last time was rushed up a little bit. Now I think it's more clear and you need to sleep on it because this is a required thing in this class. This mechanism, why this happens. <coughs> Powers of A repeating, therefore there's a <coughs> Um, so now what I'm going to do here is complicate this process a little bit. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to take all the co-primes with 26. So let's hope we have enough space here to write them down. The co-primes, I'm going to pick, first of all, a three of them. So the example here is n is 26. I'll write it somewhere here. And a equals 9. These are the co-primes in C26. Um, and then what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this, this, uh, this uh, set of powers of a. So who is P9 in here? Uh, remember we did this in class was 9. 9 squared is what? 81 modulo 26. And that was 3. And then 9 cubed is what? 3 times 9? 27 modulo 26? 1. So the set in here, it's only three values, 9, 3, and 1. So I'm going to write that set here, 9, 9 squared, that's 3 and 1, that's 9 cubed. That's the PA, P9. And what I'm going to do next is to pick all the co-primes in CN. That's a long table. It's all these, how many values are in here? I think there are 12, right? Uh, and we're going to say, I want to take this value and divide it at all those. Divide, divide, divide. So how much is 1 divided at 9? Right, but that in Z26 is 3. Because 3 times 9 is 27, which is 1. How about 1 divided at 9 squared, which is 3? 1 divided at 3 is 9. Because 9 times 3 is 27, will give me 1. So. Just to be clear what I'm doing, I'm taking this value on the left side and I'm dividing it at all those three. So when I divide one by nine, I get three because three times nine gives me one. When I divide one with nine squared, it gives me nine because nine times three <coughs> is one, modulo. Everything is modulo 26. How about one divided at one? How much is that? That's one because one times one is one. Okay, how about the 3? If I divide 3 at 9, what do I get? What value in Z26 multiply with 9 gives me a 3? 9. 9 times 9 is 81. 81 modulo 26 is 3. 3 divided at 3 is 1. And 3 divided at 1 is? How about 9? 9 divided at 9 is 1. 9 divided at 3 is? 9 divided at 1 is? So I could take any co-prime I want, and when I do this division, you're going to notice some very funny values in here. Those values are exactly those co-primes, just in different order. That's not an accident. That has to do with how co-primes work. If you take these particular three co-primes, one, three, and nine, those are not random co-primes. I picked them for a reason. When you divide them with nine, nine squared, and nine cubed, that's my P9 set, you get on each line all three of them. So you need to go home and figure out why this is. Yes? Uh, how come, like, uh, 17? With 26? 17 has no prime factor for 26, right? Oh. 17 and 26 have no... The co-primes is every value remainder that's not having any common prime factors with it. 
Coprimes doesn't mean they're necessarily primes. It only means they don't share common factors with n, which in our case is 26. So you look at this list here, 14 is not a prime number, but it's coprime of 15, because there's no primes between them. Okay, and in Z26, we, we listed here, here all the coprimes of 26, right? 25 is not a prime, 9 is not a prime, but they are coprimes to 26 because they have no common prime to 26. Who's with me so far with this calculation here? Okay, any question about this? Those not all the coprimes. I just got 1, 3, and 9, but there are more coprimes in Z26. So the, my next batch is going to be 5, 15, and 19. And of course, I'm picking them with, with, a, with a special purpose in mind. Eventually, I'm going to list all of them. How many co-primes are in C26? 12. 12. So eventually, I'm going to have all 12, because we need to do it for all 12. But the way I'm going to organize them is to get a nice structure here. So if I divide 5 at 9, what do I get? What multiplies with 9 to give me 5? 15. Is that true? 15 times 9 is? Modulo 26? Yeah. 5, right? Again, let's, let's make sure we understand this. 15 times 9 is 135, right? When I do modulo 26, how much is 135, aka 15 times 9? That is 26 times 5 plus 5. So modulo 26, I guess it's 5, which is correct. What do you think is going to happen when I divide 5 by 9 squared? What do you think I'm going to get here? Of course, this is organized to work that way. right? I didn't pick a random 19 to put it there. So let's verify that. 19, 19 times 3. <coughs> 9 squared is the same as 3, modulo 26. So 19 times 3 is? 57. Modulo 26, 57 modulo 26, 5, so I get a 5. About 5 divided at 1, that's 5. 15 now divided at 9, what do you think is going to be? 19. 15 divided at 3 is going to be? 5. And at 1 is going to be? 19 divided at 9 is going to be? Divided at 3 is going to be? Okay. And divided at 1 is going to be? Okay. See how magical when I divide those numbers at these powers, I get all those numbers back on every row. <coughs> the reason that happens is the same reason that the powers are repeating. <coughs> the reason those powers are repeating, when I multiply those by 9 or divide by 9, I'm going to get repeated values. And the repeated values are exactly 5, 15, and 19, which starts if, if I keep dividing by 9 or multiplying by 9, I will never get out of this set. If you take 5 or 15 or 19 and multiply by 9 as many times as you want or divide by 9 as many times as you want, you're always going to be in this set. Any value here, multiply by 9 or divided by 9 in Z26, no matter how many times, it's going to be 5 or 15 or 19. Because it's a cycle. Multiplying by 9, you go to the next one. Divided by 9, you go by the previous one. And the cycle is decided right here. The reason there are three values is because P9 has three values. Right? Because if this repeating powers of 9, I apply them to 5, they're going to be repeating after three values. Because the powers of 9 repeat after three values. You know what I'm saying? If I take 5 and I say 5 times 9, 5 times 9 squared, 5 times 9 cubed, 5 times 9 fourth. If powers of 9 are repeating, now these values are going to be repeating, right? If 9 fourth is the same as 9, then 5 times 9 fourth is going to be the same as 5 9. So the reason this repeats is because the powers of 9 repeat, so I could only get 5, 15, and 19. And when I divide or multiply by 9, I get them back. That's how I picked them. I picked 5, 15, and 19 because those are multiplied by 9 or divided by 9. Okay? Uh, I need, I need 
So, well, what's the next group here? Obviously, we didn't finish the co-primes, right? Because there are 12 of them. So the next group is going to be 7, 21, and 11. 7 divided by 9 is 21. Is that true? How much is 21 times 9? 21 times 9 is 189, which is 26 times. Seven. How much is 26 times 7? 140 plus 42, 182. So the remainder is? How about 7 divided at 9 squared, which is 3? Who do you think that's going to be? 11. 11 times 3? Modulo 26? Seven. How about I divide 7 at 1? What do I get? That's easy. Seven. Now 21 divided at 9 is going to be? 11. Because 11 times 9, 99, modulo 26. 99 is 26 times how much? 3 plus... 26 times 3 is what? 78. To 78, what do I need to add to get to 99? 21. 21 divided by 3, that's easy, because it's the arithmetic division. How much is 21 divided by 3? 7. And 21 divided at 1 is? 40. So 11 is going to be 7, 21, and 11 by the same principle. So now we almost done. We have one more group, right? There's a bunch of co-primes that are not listed yet. And those are 17, 25, and 23. <coughs> 17 divided by 9 is 25. 25, we're going to think of it for easy calculation, not as 25, but as? <laughs> minus 1. Minus 1 times 9? Minus 9, which is 17. You guys follow that? 25 is the same as minus 1. So minus 1 times 9, minus 9, which is the same as 17. Uh, the next one is going to be here 23, which is who? Minus 3, right? Minus 3 times 3 is 17. And this is going to be 17, of course, because it's divided by 1. 25, that's going to be 23. Uh, let's check that. 23 is minus 3 times 9, which is the same as minus 1. Minus 27 modulo 26 is the same as minus 1, which is 25. So we can check here, minus 1, 25, and this is minus 3. Equal to that's just for easy calculations, OK? We could do it, this whole thing with 25. If I do 25 times 9 and I get that value, take the modulo, it's going to give me that, that number. So this in here is 23, that's going to be 17, <laughs> and this is going to be 25, and this one here is going to be 17, 25, 23. The way I came up with those groups is by taking a prime like 5, co-prime, and then running first the, the, the division. I actually did it not this way. I take 5 and I write the division. I have it here on paper, 15, 19, 5. So I knew the numbers I need at 15 and 19. And then I take the next one, 7. I didn't know 21 and 11, but when I did the division at 9, uh, 9 squared and 9 cubed, I get... 21, 11, and 7, so I knew the next number are 21, 11 in this, what did you call it, group? Yeah. Let's call it coset, because in algebra that's how they are called, coset. Every one of these is a coset. <coughs> this is the main set, this is the P9, right? And each one of those three are cosets with it. And again, the way you identify them quickly is take 17, do the division, or you can do the multiplication with 9 because you get the same values. And then that's the, the, and each one of them will have exactly the size. 
because if the powers of 9 repeat after 3 elements, every one of those being multiplied with 9 under power or division with 9 under power will also repeat after 3 values. One more step. All right? If this is not complicated enough, we're going to do one more step. We're going to say in here, for each one of these <coughs> lines, each one of these lines, we look at the quotients. When I divided, uh, I'm going to pick this 5. 5, I divided at this power of a, I get what? 15, 19, and 5. I would like to write down the smallest one of them. So between 15, 19, and 5, what's the smallest? <coughs> By smallest, I mean positive smallest. Minus 1 is not allowed. So all these ones, the smallest is going to be 5, right? Because the smallest in this group, if I read the line, they get 5, 5, 5. How about in this group? If I look at the quotients, those are the quotients. When I divided 7 at the powers of A, I got 21, 11, and 7. So what's the smallest? 7. 7. On this line is 7. On this line is 7. And how about in this group? When I divided 17, I got 25, 23, and 17. The smallest of them is 17. And of course, 17, those lines are the same, just permuted a little bit. They're the same value. So this one's 17. This one will also be 17. So what is this column? And in here, what is the value here? 1, 1, 1. I look at the row. I have three quotients divided at powers of 9. I pick the smallest one. So for each row, I pick the smallest quotient. We're going to call this set QA. So who's QA? It's the set of smallest <coughs> quotients when a co-prime divides when it's divided. <coughs> with a power, with all the powers of, of A, right? So I, that's what I have here. I have the powers of A. I took all the co-primes. I divided with every single power, and I picked the smallest quotient. <coughs> how many people follow me? How did I build this set QA? Hands up. Up so I can see them, please. I'm going to repeat that again. I take all the co-primes. This only works for co-primes, so I don't bother with things like 4 or 13 that are not co-primes. For each one of them, they group nicely. If you know how to do this, you get immediately a group of three. And for this group of three, we look at the smallest quotient being the same values, all these guys are going to have the smallest quotient five. In this group here, the same values, the smallest quotient is 70. Okay? So um, before I move on, I would like to do the same. I, I would like to do the same, just to, to give another example. Uh, I have the same set, Z26, but I'll choose a different A. So I'll choose a, another A, another A. So instead of A equal, uh, what they have there, 9, I'm going to choose A equal now 5, which is good because it's a co-prime, right? So then who is P5? <coughs> P5 is different than P9, right? So it's 5, of course. 5 squared is minus 1. Or 25. 5 cubed is 5 times the previous value, right? So that's minus 5, right? Because it's 5 times this guy, which is minus 1. So how much is minus 5? <coughs> 21. And finally, the 5 fourth is going to be 5 cubed squared, right? which is one. So the order of this five is what? What's the power at which I get one? Four. And the inverse of five, which is written five at minus one, is five at the previous power before the order. So that would be five at three, which is? Now I want to do the same. So I take here the co-primes in C26, all of them. 
And now I have the the I have this value. So like before, I'm gonna say I try to divide by five. Then I try to divide by five square, which is minus one. Then I try to divide by five cube, which is minus five. And then I try to divide by five fourth, which is one. And then I'm gonna write down the quotients in the Q. This is gonna be Q5 now. This is Q9 here. Now the co-prime set is the same. I didn't change the n, so it's still z26, c26, the co-primes. What I change is the factorization. Instead of dividing by this power set of nines, I'm, devour, I'm dividing by the power set of fives. Should work the same way. Although those groups now will be on what size? Four. So the first group is easy. The first group is going to be exactly one. It's, it's going to be the power of five. That's the first group. One, five, five square, which is minus one, and five cube, which is minus five. That's the first set. So let's do the division. One divided by five is minus five, right? Is that right? Because the inverse is minus five. <coughs> then one divided by minus one is? Minus one. And then one divided by minus five is? Five. And then one divided by one is one. Now, again, when, when I write it minus one, if you guys don't like minus one, you can read it as 25. And if you don't like minus five, you can read it as 21. Again, in, in Z26, all those values, minus one, 25, and five squared, are the same exact value. Um, so what happens when I do five here? 5 divided by 5 will be 1. 5 divided by minus 1 will be minus 5. 5 divided by minus 5 will be minus 1. And 5 divided by 1 will be 5. How about the minus 1? Minus 1 divided by 5 is going to be 5. Is that true? Is minus 1 divided by 5 equal 5? Five? 5, why? Because 5 times 5 is? 25, which is minus 1. Uh, I, got, I, I noticed the question. Let me finish this part and then I'll answer it. So then f minus 1 divided by minus 1 is? Minus 1 divided by minus 1. 1, right? Minus 1 divided by minus 5? Minus 5. Because minus 5 times minus 5 is? 25. And 25 is the same as minus 1. Uh, if it's easier, you can do it either with minus 1 or 25. Maybe this division here would have been easier to use 25 instead, because we say 25 divided by minus 5 is minus 5. 25 divided by 1, that's 25, that's minus 1. And the last row is minus 5 divided by 5 is? Minus 5 divided by 5. Minus 1. Minus 5 divided by minus 1? Minus 5 divided by minus 5. And minus 5 divided by 1. <coughs> now there are two questions. Yes? I was going to say, is 5n always divisible by z? What? Is 5n always divisible by z? Yes. Seven more minutes and I'm there. That's a fundamental theorem of number theory. Very famous guy wrote that stuff. And that's what makes crypto systems work. That exact thing. So we're trying to prove that in here. Yes? I was just going to say, like, you can use the inverse to find a lot of them too. Because, like, minus, yes. minus 1 over minus 5. The inverse is in the set. We just said that. The inverse being in the set will help you out. So whatever you want to do this calculation is fine. I do it in whatever way it's more convenient. Sometimes I'm going to use minus 1. Sometimes I'm going to use 25. Whatever it's easier to divide in there. And when I say minus 5, of course, I mean 21. So if you want to read those values correctly, like the remainders, you have to put the proper value. Each one of them corresponds to a remainder. Right? So for all this up, in a positive sense, what's the minimum quotient? Four. Minus 5 is not allowed. Minus 5 reads as 21. And minus 1 is really 25. 
So if I look at the minimum quotient in the positive side, I get 1 for all of them. OK, well, how about the next group? Obviously, those are only four coprimes, but there are 12 coprimes. So how about 3? When I divide 3 by 5, what do you think I get? 3 divided by 5, I say I get 11. <coughs> 11 times 5? 55 modulo 26? 55 modulo 26 is 3. How about when I divide 3 with minus 1? What do I get? Minus 3, which is 23. How about when I divide 3 with minus 5? Well, it's the same like this one with the negative sign. If 3 divided by 5 is 11, 3 divided by minus 5 is negative 11, which is who? Who's negative 11? 15. And 3 divided by 1 is? <coughs> so now I know who's going to be in this group. Right? The next one is going to be 11. The next one is going to be 23, same as minus 3. And the last one is going to be 15, same as minus 11. So now 11 divided by 5 is going to give me 23. 11 divided by minus 1 is going to be minus 11 or 15. 11 divided by minus 5 is going to be 3. And 11 divided by 1 is going to be 7. And 23 divided by 5 is going to be 15. Can we verify that really quick? 15 times 5? 75. How much is 75? How close is 75 to a multiple of 26? What's a multiple of 26 around there? 78. So 75 is? 3. Minus 3. We all follow that? Hands up who's following me here. Okay. So 15 times 5, 75, which is minus 3. Minus 3 is the same as 23. Next one up is going to be 3. Because 3 times minus 1 is minus 3. And the next one up is going to be who? 11. Because 11 times minus 5 is minus 55, which I say is the same as minus 3. And the last one here is going to be 23. And this is 3, 11, uh, 23. So in this group, what's the minimum quotient that makes everybody work? If I look at all those quotients, which are the same as the numbers, what do I get as the minimum quotient? Only positive numbers allowed. It's three. This is like the governor of the set, this three. The governor here is one. The governor or the controller is three. And there is one more set, right? There's another set of four because there's 12 co-primes and we only listed eight of them. <coughs> so that set is seven. Seven divided by five is 17. That group, how much is 17 times five? 85. 85, modulo 26. How much is 85? It's 26 times three plus seven. Plus seven. 7 divided by minus 1 is minus 7, of course, which is who? 19. 19. 7 divided at minus 5 is minus 17, which is the same as? 9. 9. And 7 divided at 1 is 7. So now I know who's in this last group. 19, 9, um, sorry. That's right, the mean order. 17, 19, and 9. So, of course, they're going to cycle themselves. 19, 9, 7, 17, 9, 7, 17, 19, 7, 17, 19. Nine. So, this group, who's the governor? What's the smallest quotient that makes this stuff work? Yeah. 
Turns out you can do this for any coprime you pick. I, I picked Z26 and I did it for two separate primes. One was nine, the other one's five. I could have picked any other number like 25 or, or uh, 19 or seven. Each one of those builds a power set. And then when I do the coprimes division by power set, I get this table and I get this cube set. Yes. Why does it happen that when you pick an A that is co-prime with 26, it like breaks it into even groups? Like why is, you have four, 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 you have three threes, like why isn't it like three, three, and then two? That's a great question. It's just the theorem that we're about to state. Oh, fantastic. It's a very famous theorem. <laughs> and it's fundamental, not just in number theory, in all algebra. It doesn't just happen for numbers. It happens for a lot of places. So that theorem, which is the theorem of a guy very famous, Lagrange. Right? Old dude, dead long time ago. Right? But very famous. He said, you know, I think the set CN is actually the set PA times the set QA. That's what he said. He said, you can think of, this is the co-primes. This is the power set, powers of A set. And this is the quotient set. So QA is the stuff that we did in there. So of course, what do we mean by a product? This is not, anybody heard of Cartesian product? How is that written, Cartesian product? When you write the Cartesian product, what's the sign between the sets? When you write the Cartesian product, you write an X, right? Yes, That's not an X. So what do I mean by this? What is this? This is the set of all products. Big sum A at the power from this set and the quotient. And make the product. Right? You can pick anybody from here with anybody from here, make the product. So there's a bunch of products that you can make that way. And the theorem says all those products is the same set as the entire set of coprimes. So now to prove this, we need to prove actually three things. So the proof has three parts. That's answering the question why this happens. So part one, we won't have time for a full proof. But we have enough time to build the intuition, and you guys can read it from the notes. Part one is very easy. It's saying any C that's in <coughs> this sign. Anybody remembers this sign? What is this? Any. For any C in CN, <coughs> there is some power in PA, and there is some quotient in QA such that C is a to the k times q. This is saying anybody in this set, any co-prime, can be written as a power times a quotient. It doesn't prove the whole theorem because it only goes one way. It says this set is included in this set because every element here, it's also here. In English, we can state it like that. Every element in the set Cn is also in PA times QA. Or we can write it as CN, as I said, is included in PA times QA. Because they say every element here is in here. That's not, that's not even necess not necessary to make a proof because it's by definition. The reason every coprime writes this way is that that's how we build QA. We look at the coprimes, and every coprime is listed with a quotient times some power of A. Right? For every coprime, look at these tables. Any coprime you pick, that coprime is, we pick a quotient, right? Three. So that coprime here is going to be three times the power of A. Is that clear? It's due to the construction of Q. That's how we build this set QA. 
we took every single co-prime and we said, okay, divide the low powers and keep one quotient. But that one quotient means that quotient times whatever the power was the quotient for will give me back the co-prime. So every single co-prime must be a power times a quotient. <laughs> so that's due, that's true from QA build. The way we build it at QA, that's done. So part two. The other way. Part two says, no matter how you pick a power of A in PA, and no matter how you pick a quotient in the set QA, so I pick any power and any quotient, when you make the product, the quotient times that power, that product is in CN. That's, that's saying the other way, that's saying every element that's Q from uh, Q times AK, where Q is in the Q set, and AK, of course, is a power of A, so it's in the power set. Every such element is also in CN. Or if we want to write mathematically, that says that product set QA times PA is included in CN. That means every element from here, it's also here. Friday, we're going to talk about sets. So we're a little bit ahead of time. Today's Friday. This? No, today's Friday. Tuesday. <laughs> Where is the attendance sheet, by the way? We still have it? OK. Everybody got the attendance sheet? So what do we actually need to prove here? What is it saying? Of course, Q times A is a number in Zn. It corresponds to a remainder because it's an integer, it corresponds to a remainder. But what is this? This is not all integers. So what do we have to prove? What does it mean to be in Cn? What is Cn? So what is this saying? It's saying that every time you make this product, you're going to get a co-prime. So in effect, what this statement says, the GCD between this product, Q, A, K, and N, must be that's what it's effectively saying. Saying whether we make the product, of course that's going to be in Zn because everybody's in Zn. Every integer is in Zn. But we don't want to just Zn. We want to be co-prime. That's also very easy to prove. The reason this product is actually co-prime with n is because both factors are co-prime with n. Is that true? So we're going to say that's true. Because the GCD of Q and N is 1, and the GCD of A to the K is 1. We already talked about this before, right? We say if A is a coprime, A at any power is also a coprime. You guys remember that from like half an hour ago? We just made that argument on the board. If A was chosen to be a coprime, any power is also a coprime. So I don't have to worry about that. But how about this Q? These quotients here, can these quotients be not co-primes with N? Look at those quotients. Who are the quotients? What do you see here, 21, 11, 7? Who are those numbers? Those are the same as the one here, right? And who are those numbers, 25, 23, 17? The same like the ones in here. And who are those numbers here, 3, 11, 23, 15? These are the co-primes from here. So the quotients, all of them, not just the ones in QA, just all of them. QA doesn't contain all the quotients. See how it didn't contain 15 and 23. It only contains the smallest. But every single quotient in this table or this table is actually a co-prime number. Huh? Who follows me here? Maybe we need to, to, to read the notes for this when we get home. But the idea here is that the quotients are actually the co-prime values. That's why the Q is co-prime with N, A to the K is co-prime with N, and if not, nobody has common factors with N in a product, the product will have no common factors. That's the same like before. Where can a common, fra a, a, a common prime factor show up 
if, if there will be a common <coughs> p prime number here, to be in the q times a, it has to be either in q or in a. But if neither q nor a has any common primes to them, their product cannot come up with a new prime factor. The, the prime factors in the product comes from either q or a. Okay. Any questions about this? Is this enough? So what did we prove? We proved any number in Cn is in this set. And we prove every number in G set is in Cn. Doesn't that mean they're equal? That means they're equal. So I think so far, part one and part two together <coughs> means the sets are the same. Cn uh, is indeed all the products that you can obtain from PA times QA. But Lagrange theorem says a little bit further, just a little tiny bit further. The sets are the same, but also the sizes. If I take the size of CN, that's the size of PA times the size of QA. So one thing is to say the sets contain the same elements. Of course, they're going to have the same size. So from here, if the sets are the same, the set of CN is the same size as the set of PA times QA. This bars mean size, means how many elements are in there. But the theorem doesn't say PA times QA bars. It says bar of QA, bar of PA. Why is it this? Why this set product is the same as if I take the size of P times the size of Q? In other words, think about this. What's the size of coprimes here? How many coprimes are here? 12. What's the size of PA in this case? How many elements are in PA? Four. So how many elements would be in QA? One, three, and seven. How about on this size? How many elements are in PA? Three, so how many would be in Q? So why, for this, while it may appear intuitively easy, there is one thing that we're going to do in the next module that we need to prove this, which is part three. It may be a mystery right now, but in about a week, it will be clear why that is. How do we prove that the, the, this, this product set, the size of it, is actually the product of the two sizes? What we need for that to happen? What we need to happen is to say, when we make the products, all products, which are some Q times A to the power, Q1, uh, and then another product, Q2 times A to another power, are different values. So that's part three. What I mean here is to say, the reason this, this could maybe sometimes not be the product of the sizes, the only way that could happen is if you make two products, because there's many products, any, anybody from P times anybody in Q gives me a new value. What if some of those values are the same, right? For, for the size of this to be the product of the two sizes. I need every time I make a product, somebody from here or somebody from here, to get a different value. Because if I get the same value, I get repeated value, and then the product set does not correspond to the sizes of the individual sets. So the part three will say, any such products, you take two different quotients and two different powers, they will result in a different value. There's no way by doing products to get the same value. <laughs> In other words, in these tables here, every time you get a power, one of these powers, times a quotient, 1, 5, 7, or 17, you're always going to get a different value. Right? <coughs> no two quotients times two powers will give the same value. Same thing in here. No two quotients like 3 and 7, 3 multiply with some power, 7 multiply with some power, they will never give the same value. The reason is 7 multiplied with any power always gives values in this group. While 3 multiplied with these powers always gives values in this group. 
This group and this group have no common values. So by multiplying three with powers, we always get this. By multiplying seven with powers, we always get this. Seven. You cannot get the same value. So this can be proven algebraically, formally, quite easily by saying if, by contradiction, if this is to happen, Q1 and Q2 will be two quotients that do the same job, will be this kind of thing, you know, 5 and 19. And I would have no reason to pick them both, because I always pick what quotient? The smallest. The smallest. So if they correspond to the same power, I wouldn't have had both of them in QA. I only have the smallest one. That's an exercise for you. The proof is in the notes, but I'm not going to do this on the board. So we need this part three not to prove the sets adequate, but to prove that this size here is actually P of A times the size of Q of A, which you already seen example. This is four times three, this is three times four. They give 12. That's the answer to your question. Why this always come up nice? Because of the three step rules. Lagrange theorem is not an undergraduate level material. Okay. We are in the master student mathematics realm now with the Lagrange theorem. It applies not just to numbers, to all kinds of groups. The general theorem says the size of a subgroup <laughs> divides the size of the group. So we can write that down now. We're going to say uh, <coughs> Any questions about this? This is the kind of thing that you guys need to take home and understand two things. Each step separately, which is easy. Uh, all these three proofs are in a few lines and quite easy to follow. But then why those three steps imply two things? It implies that any product here is a coprime and the other way, any coprime is a product. But also, the number of elements here in this product set is actually the number of elements in P times the number of elements in Q. Because every time you make a product, you get a different value. You cannot repeat values that way. That's why the product sizes work. So now we have a bunch of consequences of this Lagrange theorem. Consequences in mathematics are sometimes called corollary. So let me state Lagrange as who's the size of Cn is size of Pa times size of QA. Okay. Who's the size of CN? Remember what we said? How do we call the number of co-primes? We have a symbol for it. How do we call it? <coughs> hmm? P. P of N. So that's P of N. Who's the size of PA? How many elements are in PA? Hmm? V. That's V or order, we call this order of A, right? What's the power that A at that power gives me one? Times something that we're not going to bother with. This QA, we're going to say that's something. We don't, we don't further, if we are to keep further, but we won't go further in this class, we start analyzing what's up with QA. But we don't do that. So the immediate consequence of this is that V, the order, let's just say order of A has to be a divider of phi of N. Because phi of N is V times something. We don't care what that something is for now. And if you study further number theory, you're going to look into QA, what's up with that. But what's important for now is the order of A, aka, what's the order? The power V such that A at V is 1. That's the order. What the power is, I get one, is a divider of phi of n. That has a name. We just proved uh, <coughs> Euler's theorem. <coughs> that is, any order of any coprime, doesn't matter who A is, any order must be a divisor for phi of n. Phi of n does not depend on A. Phi of n is fixed for n. n is 26. How much is phi of n? How much is phi of n for 26? 12. 12. That says every order in Z26 is going to be a divisor of 12. 
who did those exercises when, when I say in the recitation seven? <coughs> seven and somebody, right? You got 12 there. You are unlucky because 12 is like the biggest value you get. It has to be a divisor of 12. If you are more lucky, you can get a two or a three or a four. Can you get a five? Can the order be five? No, no because the order has to divide 12. So the possible order in Z26 are two, three, who else? Four, six, and 12. Those are the only possible orders I can get in Z26 because they have to be a divisor of 12. So this is a nice theorem that makes cryptography work, by the way. The whole RSA Tuesday is going to be based on this theorem. And the regular sections cannot prove it, okay? Because they don't do PA and QA, and without PA and QA, you can't prove this. There's another proof that's kind of mystifying everybody. It's in the notes if you want to read that. I strongly recommend this kind of proof, which explains why PA and QA matter. It shows you that the co-prime set factorizes very nicely into the powers times the quotients, or the other powers times the quotients. But there is an important consequence here. How much is A at phi of n? <coughs> Well, P of n is V times something, right? So it's A at V <coughs> times something, VK. Because P of n is a multiple of V, right? So how much is A at VK? How much is A at V? One. That's one. So. Every A has a different order V. Like we did those examples in recitations, right? For some 9, the order was 3. From a different one, 5, the order was 4. And somebody who did a 7, what was the order for 7 in Z26? Do you guys remember? <coughs> People did it, and he did it. And then the order was 12. You had to go all the way to 12. So every A has a different V, but all Phi of n acts like an order for everybody, right? It's not the order, it's not the smallest v, but phi of n acts like an order because it gives you one. So we can say phi of n acts like an order for every co-prime. <coughs> Again, every co-prime has a different order, 3 or 4 or 6 or 12. But if you just want the power to get 1, which is not the smallest power, there's a power to get you 1 for every co-prime. That's phi of n. Like 12, every co-prime raised to the power of 12 will be 1. That also means I can compute the inverse really quick now. Who's the inverse? It's just like with the orders. If a at v is 1, the inverse was a at what? If A at V is 1, who's the inverse of A? A at V minus 1. But I can do the same reasoning here. If A at V of N is 1, where, who's the inverse? A at V of N minus 1. Right? Because if I multiply A at V of N minus 1 with A, you know, check. A at V of N minus 1 times A is how much? A at phi of n, which is 1. So what I told you before is if you want to compute the inverse, you have to find first the order, right? You find that v, and then v minus 1 gives you a at v minus 1 gives you the inverse. It turns out you don't even want to find, need to find the v. All you need to know is this phi of n, which is only one value for everybody, right? Phi of n does not depend like the order on a. <coughs> If I know phi of n in z26 is 12, I can compute any inverse immediately for any a as what power? a as what power? Uh, Which, oh, but I don't want to pick the order. So I pick any coprime. Where was the z26? Here's the coprimes, right? At what power do I need to raise these guys to get 1, independent of the order? 12. 12 is a power that anybody <coughs> raise a power of 12 gives me 1. Therefore, 
What's the inverse for everybody in here? 11. 7 at 11 will be the inverse of 7. 5 at 11 will be the inverse of 5. 17 at 11 will be the inverse of 17. 19 at 11 will be the inverse of 19. When you can find the order, the order is smaller than 12. Could be 3, could be 4, could be 6. You can do that. Find the order, and then a at v minus 1 is the inverse. Or if you know phi of n, 12, we could just say raise to the power 11, <coughs> you're going to get the inverse. Raise to the power 12, you're going to get 1. So that's faster if you know phi of n. You don't have to compute the order for everybody. You just know phi of n, which is a lookup table value. You raise the power. That's in your, in your homework. Uh, and I have two more examples of this breakup here that uh, uh, we can look up. Let, let's do one. Actually, no. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something else. Uh, there's two more examples of this in the notes. So you should make sure you understand how P of A and Q of A works. If you understand P of A and Q of A, rest it's easy. The critical part here is to say what happened. I get the co primes. I got the power some, some A, 5. And when I factorize it, I guess this Q set of smallest quotients. And then the theorems will say, this is the power set times Q, which gives me this phi of n property that acts like an order for everyone. Therefore, A at phi minus 1 is the inverse. No matter who A is, the fixed power I need to raise to get the inverse, it's always 11, easy 26. So now, <coughs> Now, we've done with that track. We just have everything ready to next week to do the RSA, which is how all the word cryptography works. Linear ciphers are very easy to break. But RSA, which relies on these theorems that we put there, Lagrange and, uh, and uh, Euler's theorem, it's very hard to break. So that's the one that next week we're going to do. But now we have to continue the other track, which is the GCD. Um, so let's, uh, let's take our GCD here. GCD um, of 22 and 6. That one example we did before, right? 22 and 6. So uh, how did that go? We say A equal 22, B equal 6, right? Q equal 3, remainder is 4. Right, very good. So then we move into A equal 6, B equal 4, Q equal 1, R equal 2, and then I'm leaving some space because I'm going to add stuff in between those lines just to warn you. Then I have what? A equal what? 4, B equal 2, Q equal 2, R equal 0, stop. Who's the GCD? GCD last B. That is very good. That was the Euclid algorithm, which moves from problem to problem to problem. It still has the problem of computing GCD, but with smaller numbers. So it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it gets R equals 0, which is guaranteed to happen at some point. When R equals 0, knows the GCD. And the nice part is the GCD stayed the same. Between 22 and 6, I get the same GCD as 6 and 4, same GCD as 4 and 2. And then whenever I compute it, I don't have to go back in any way, right? You know when you call recursively a procedure? Anybody implemented ever a recursive procedure call? Hands up. Sometimes when you call something recursively, you get the answer from that recursive call. You have to do something with it to return the current procedure, right? So that happens before the recursive, recursive call. You make some preparations. You do the recursive call. You get the answer. Then you do some post-processing, and then you close the current procedure, right? In here, there's no post-processing. The moment the last recursive call gets the GCD, that's the GCD I was looking for from the beginning. I don't need to prepare anything. That's nice. That's the algorithm, right? Uh-huh. Uh, hmm. 
we need to do something extra here, which is, it turns out that there's more to it than that. The GCDN 22 and 6 is 2, but there is a, another theorem that says not only the GCD is whatever it is, it's that. It says there are these massive coefficients, let's just call them x and y, integers. Uh, they call the GCD coefficients. And they have the property that A times X plus B times Y gives you the GCD of AB. So, of course, we can find the GCD. That's a little But we need to find more than the GCD. We need to find X and Y. Now, you can see why this is a harder problem than just finding the GCD. Why is that? If I, find, if I have x and y, can I get the GCD? Of course. I just run ax plus by. But if I have the GCD, can you tell me who x and y is? That's not so easy. In fact, that's quite a hard problem. So you can see why now x and y are a more powerful hammer than the GCD. Because from x and y, I get the GCD. But from GCD, I don't necessarily get the x and y. Well, can anybody figure out what would be an X and Y suitable for 22 and 6? 22 times who plus 6 times Y. How do I get this to be 2? You have to be integers. Integers, but you can pick any integers you want. So I'm going to pick here 4. <coughs> 4 times 6? 24. What do I need here? Negative 1. Negative 1. Now, this is not unique. I could have picked different values, right? How about, uh, how about I pick here, say, 2, 22 times 2, 44. What do I need to subtract to get 2? I need to subtract 42, so that would be like minus 7. So the, the coefficients are not unique. And we don't care finding all of them. Just, just some x and some y. Once I have an x and y, I'm good. And very importantly, they're not unique. I may get some coefficients. You get different coefficients. You get different coefficients, different coefficients. There's plenty of x and y pairs that achieve the same result. But finding one of the pairs, not, I mean, I'm very smart, right? So I, I just, no, I'm not. I just, I have the answer on paper, right? How do I come up with these values, right? <laughs> I got it from the paper. But how are you going to come up with those values when I give you that in the meter? Hey, compute the coefficients of that guy. Yeah. Right? So there's two sides of this story. One side is to do it. That's meaning complicating the GCD algorithm, the Euclid algorithm, a little bit. We need to add something to it to get those coefficients. And the other side is proving the theorem. Proving the theorem that says there are actually an X and Y that do this. How do you prove that there's always an X and Y, that X and Y exist, you know? So the theorem says there exists X and Y. Of course, there's not just one X and Y. There's many pairs, but we need to show that there is one, at least one. So here's the side with the GCD. Procedurally, how do we get X and Y? Uh, the only thing that we need is to, when we finish here at the stop, to go backwards, right? The trick is, when I stop, coefficients are really easy. Another problem, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna add here two columns, x equal, y equal, x equal, y equal, x equal, y equal. So the only difference is procedurally in terms of a recursive call, when I call from here, here, and from here, here, I stop. Now I'm gonna have to compute the coefficients inside the last call, <coughs> the one that returns first, which is very easy. Once this happens, I can, I can figure out the coefficients right away. Uh, the coefficients I have here are um, 1. And the y, I think, is uh, 1 minus q. How much is 1 minus q in this line? Negative 1. 
Would that work? 1 and minus 1. For this AB, would it work? Yeah. 1 times 4, let's verify that. 1 times 4 plus minus 1 times 2, how much is it? Is the GCD, right? <coughs> so now that I have those coefficients, the coefficients are really easy when you stop. They always 1 and 1 minus 2. They're not unique. So uh, somebody else can figure out, hey, uh, that's the same as 0 and 1. You could have that coefficient if you want. 0 and 1 will work too, right? Because 0 times A is 0, and 1 times B will be B, which is the GCD. So 0, 1 will work. 1 and 1 minus Q will work. The point is, when I'm done with the stop sign here, it's easy to find out the coefficients. They're always 0 and 1. The problem is here. Are these 0 and like any number or just for 22? <laughs> for every number, but only when you stop. <coughs> so that's very important. This 0, 1 works when you stop. They don't work. When we go now backwards after the call returns, we got to do something because the coefficients here are not going to be the same like in here. <coughs> These coefficients work for 4 and 2, but they don't work for 6 and 4. Follow me? So this is the case where I return the procedure. I'm done with the inner procedure. When I go here, I need a little bit of processing to compute new coefficients for this, for this second call. And that's, that's the first call, second or third call. Third call finished with stop, so I get 0, 1, or 1 and 1 minus Q, whichever one you like. Now, how do I get from these coefficients to these coefficients? How do I compute coefficients in here? There's a formula. So the formula is, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write here the formula. X in here is uh, the previous y, or the, the previous <coughs> calculated y. So who's the previous y? I, I'm going to go forward with, they say, the Schwartz formula. Again, you choose one of those. This is not, this are one out of the two. So if x in here is the previous y, what's the previous y here? Minus 1, right? And the new y, so this is going to be <laughs> minus 1. Let's compute it here. The new y is um, the previous, let me see here, is the previous x <coughs> minus q times previous uh, y. Let's see if that works. Always verify this stuff. So who's the previous x? Minus q comes from here. This q refers to the current q. So it's minus, how much is this q? 1 times the previous y. How much is this? Let's, let's verify that this stuff works. Uh, how do we verify that this works? So verify. This is what we need to verify. Who's A in this case? We need to verify AX plus BY is the GCD. So who's A? <coughs> 6 times, who's X here? Minus 1 plus, who's B? 4. Times, who's Y? How much is this? Good or not good? So when I return from the third call to the second call, the GCD stays the same. That was nice about the Euclid algorithms. But these coefficients have to be recomputed. And the recomputation comes out of the previous coefficients. And who else? What else is in here that's not just previous coefficients? The current Q. <coughs> Remember somebody asked me yesterday, uh, what's up with the Q? We don't need Q in Euclid's algorithm. 
Well, that's where Q comes into play in recomputing the coefficients when I go up. So why it's here is 2. Let's apply the same formulas. Now this procedure is going to return, right? So now when I go back to the main procedure, what do I get? Who's this x? So x in here is the previous y. So that is 2. And y is the previous x minus q times previous y. So how much is the previous x? Minus 1. Minus how much is the q? 3. This q is 3 now. Right? <coughs> so minus uh, 3 times two. Oh, 2. So how much is that? Negative 7. Is that even going to work? Let's, let's see. 2 and negative 7. How much is 2 times 22? Oh, I think we just verified that, that minus 7 works. 2 times 22 is 44. Minus 7 times 6 is 42. So we can say here, verify somewhere. We need to say 22 times 2 plus 6 times minus 7 is 2. Always verify this calculation, because you can easily get you know, tangled up in those calculations. The easiest way to check is ax plus b always have to be the GCD. So the, the difference that we added to the Euclid algorithm, the Euclid algorithm goes the same. It still calls exactly the same from AB to BR, AB to BR, keeps going down. When it sees R, it stops. That part didn't change. <coughs> we didn't have come up with a new algorithm here. The only thing we did was to add something to it, to say, when you stop, it's easy to see what the coefficients are. And then it's easy to see how to recompute those coefficients for the previous round, and previous round, and previous round, and in the end, I get x and y. <coughs> there is a reason why this formula works. The reason for this formula is in the previous round, how those coefficients work. The previous round is for b and r. So for b and r, I have b times previous x plus uh, r times uh, previous y is the GCD. So from here, I need to prove now that those two coefficients are good for the current round. That is a times previous y. That's why I want x to be previous y. Plus b times this thing, which is previous x minus q times previous y. <coughs> Would also be the GCD. That's very easy for you guys to check. If this worked for the procedure that just returned, those were the, the coefficients I needed. This procedure was called on BNR, right? That's how the Euclid advances. It calls the, the next round on BNR. If that worked for BNR, gives me GCD, verify with very simple algebra that A times previous Y plus B times that is the GCD. That means the coefficients I need, the new X is going to be previous Y. And the new y, it's going to be this formula. That's why these formulas work. Uh, of course, you need the equation on a b, a, b, q, and r to verify this. What's the equation on a, b, q, and r? A is who? B times q plus r. B, q plus r. So if you know this and this, you should be able to prove this one line. OK. So now, um, this is an extremely powerful method. This Euclid that not just gives the GCD, but it turns those coefficients. Super powerful tool in number theory. Yes? For this second argument, or for the middle uh, row, wouldn't 1 and negative 1 also work? Yeah. OK. But guessing them can be much harder than systematically computing them. If you can guess them, you're good. Because again, they're not unique, any, anything works. But doing it this way and systematically compute them, it's much faster than trying to guess. Mm. I want to say just one more thing here. If I get these coefficients to be the GCD of n, just like the theorem is saying, I found the inverse of a modulo b. Inverse of a, so assume the GCD is 1. Because otherwise, there's no inverse, right? Let's assume who is the inverse of a modulo b? This is saying there is an inverse, right? 
GCD is one, there is an inverse of A modulo B. Who is the inverse? This algorithm, by accident, finds the inverse. Who is the inverse? We're not building power sets and all that like before. This is just another method to find the inverse. Is it A to the P of B minus 1? No. We're not doing that. That's a completely different method. Who is the inverse? I say x is the inverse. How much is a times x modulo b? Is one. Did I stun you guys a little bit? GCD has no purpose of computing the inverse necessarily. It wants these coefficients. It just so happened that x gotta be the inverse of a because ax plus b is something is 1. When I take modulo b, b o, by goes away, right? Because b is a multiple of b, by. So then ax is 1 modulo b. So not just that. Who is the inverse of b modulo a? So we have, just one second, we have four ways to find the inverse. Four ways to find a at minus 1 modulo n. Number one, try values until, until it works. Right? I could literally pick a bunch of numbers and see which one of them multiply with a gives me 1. Option 2 that we did is find the order. That's b, and then if a at b is 1, then a at b minus 1 is the inverse. Option number three, run GCD Euclid. This is called Euclid extended. It's just like Euclid, but computes coefficients. The Euclid extended gives me ax plus by uh, plus by or ny, py say, equal one. That means x is the inverse modulo b. So if I run Euclid, I got the inverse right away. The coefficient is the inverse. And number four, if, if we know phi of n, if somebody gives me phi of n, then I know the inverse. The inverse is a at phi of n minus 1. If I would knew phi of n for any coprime, the inverse is directly a at phi of n minus 1. How did you get the original x equals 0 and y equals 1? Well, if I put 0 and 1, what's the ax plus by? It's b, right? Yes. a times 0 plus b times 1 is b. But b is the GCD. So I get the GCD. If I take the, if this is give me the GCD okay, right? If I take modulo B, what do I get? A is 1. Because B is going to right? So A is 1, X must be the inverse. On the website? So, uh, guys, did you find the number theory notes? Yeah. You absolutely must read those notes, okay? Number theory from the class website. Let me show you where that I'm going to go to my first and see if they're all there. I'll just take the other one. Why will they not be there? Is this a Sure. Let me shut down the camera and then we'll do something.